good evening dear doctors so once again i have come uh, with some more oski discussion i have named this as a uh, part 2 uh, you know oski discussion in pediatrics okay so let's move on the first uh, question here is a clinical scenario so you can see this a 15 year old male presented to the hospital with yellowish discoloration of eyes for the past 2 weeks okay so LS discussion I means it's a case of jaundice everybody know that and straight away they have given the lab investigation and no more clinical clues are provided okay so complete blood count is 3900 3, means it is within the you know normal range uh, actually uh, the total uh, leukocyte count is from 4000 to 11000 so it is almost there you know so it's uh, we can't say it's uh, very abnormal hemoglobin is 11.3 gram per deciliter means there is anemia here platelet count is 200,000 and AST is 240 now this is definitely raised you know this is a normal value up to 40 unit per liter ALT is also high and alkaline phosphatase is marginally high albumin is low albumin is low okay and total bilirubin is high is 140 micromole per liter and direct component is also high now if this type of cases is provided to you and look at the question here whatever jaundice is this first you need to identify you know the interpretation here and this uh, is is actually hepatocellular jaundice hepatocellular jaundice okay or you can say hepatic jaundice uh, according to the classification jaundice are of three types prehepatic also known as hemolytic jaundice hepatocellular or hepatic jaundice and post hepatic or obstructive jaundice it clear um, cut case of hepatocellular jaundice why the question is why answer is because uh, ast and alt both are high alp is marginally high and a direct component of bilirubin as well as indirect component both are high okay clear case of hepatocellular jaundice right two causes for it you can write any causes like viral hepatitis viral hepatitis right from a b c d and e even g these days okay viral hepatitis another is alcoholic hepatitis alcoholic hepatitis but it is less likely in this case because the age of the uh, you know patient is just 15 year and you know usually they don't drink that much but it uh, belongs to adolescent age so we cannot ignore it you know it may be a case okay and another is some metabolic liver disease metabolic liver disease like what are the examples of metabolic liver disease you can think of okay like wilson disease alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency hemochromatosis you know cystic fibrosis these are the different name here okay so this type of case can be solved like this let's move on now case number two three year old boy is brought to the emergency room with a history of fever for just one day sudden onset of strider and dyspnea on examination the boy is toxic anxious febrile and have drooling of saliva with pulse rate 150 per minute and respiratory rate is 60 per minute now let's evaluate the case here now this is a three year old boy fever for just one day okay there's a sudden onset of strider and dyspnea now strider usually occur when there is obstruction okay or narrowing of the relatively bigger and upper airway so this is a um, probably a disease which is uh, involving the larynx okay or upper part of the trachea on examination the boy is toxic means sick looking and febrile and has drooling of saliva this is a very important finding okay our feature drooling of the saliva now with this history the clear-cut case is of acute epiglottitis acute epiglottitis now some of the differential diagnosis you can give of sudden onset strider in any case you know the mainly three or four number one is acute epiglottitis which we have just listed number two is croup syndrome number three is foreign body obstruction okay and number four may be acute tracheitis so this looks like acute epiglottitis because of this drooling of saliva point 
when the epiglottis is inflamed, the child cannot swallow even his or her own saliva. Okay, so this is a very important point here. What is the causative organism? It is mainly caused by Haemophilus influenza type B and Streptococcus group of organism, mainly Streptococcus pneumoniae or group A beta hemolytic streptococci. Okay, so pneumococcus, pneumococci, and group A beta hemolytic streptococci. So these are the answers for you. And what radiological sign in the X ray neck is observed? Very classical question. And if this question is asked, you can always say it is thumb sign. Thumb sign. Okay. When we take the X ray of the neck, usually the lateral view, we see swollen epiglottis, which looks like a thumb sign. I've included one X ray of the thumb sign as well. You can clearly see it here. This is thumb sign. Okay. So this is this is the X ray of the neck lateral view, which is showing thumb sign. So don't forget that one clinical pearl. I like to provide it here for you. A clinical pearl, which is not related with this topic, uh, but some other case that is, you know, steeple sign. Now, steeple sign is another, you know, common question which is asked related to the X-ray. And this is seen in Krupp syndrome. Okay, Krupp syndrome. And why they are related with each other? I mean, the croup and acute epiglottitis because the sudden onset strider. This is in a croup syndrome. Now, let's move further. Question number three. Here, there is a 12-year-old male who is brought with a history of poor growth. Poor growth. Which you can see, uh, look at the child and the child is having very stunted or short growth, you know. So, this is a case of short stature. Short stature. You already got the idea what type of question they are going to ask you. Write two obvious abnormal physical findings here in this boy. Look at carefully. Number one is this boy, okay, is having big head, okay. So I can say a macrocephaly. Macrocephaly is one, and another is a very short stature. Look at this short stature and this type of short stature now that's the question they'll ask you and the type of short stature just look at here from the vertex to the pubic sympathy let's say here is the pubic sympathy of this boy look at this length here you can look at this length and from here to the hill now very clear cut case you know uh, this boy is already 12 year old okay at 12 years of the age Look at the ratio of upper segment to lower segment. The upper segment looks much longer than the lower segment. Or in other words, lower segment looks much shorter than the upper segment. So this is clear-cut case of disproportionate short stature. Disproportionate short stature. Okay. So disproportionate short stature are also of two type. That means the upper segment is shorter or lower segment. This looks like a lower segment is much shorter than the upper one. Okay, so a classical example of this, and actually the diagnosis in this case is achondroplasia. Achondroplasia, that is the diagnosis. Okay, so these are the findings and this is the diagnosis. Now, a little bit of more question here, which is, you know, maybe asked in some related type of cases to you. Ratio of upper segment to, uh, sorry, the upper segment versus lower segment ratio, you know, upper segment to lower segment ratio according to the age in pediatric age group. At the time of birth, at birth, the upper segment to lower segment ratio is 1.7 to 1.9 to 1. Okay, so usually 1.7 to 1, we teach our students like this. Okay at three year at three years of the age it will drop to 1.3 to 1 so three for three that's how we remember okay at isn't it nine to ten years of the age okay it is one to one and after that okay dear students after that the lower segment will be longer than the upper segment so it will be 0 0.9 okay so don't forget it and now this boy, which was, uh, you know, our case, is already 12 year old. 
and uh, of course the lower limbs will be much longer uh, than the upper part let's move on question number four okay uh, look here the question number four it's a very typical case for you look at these physical findings and what is the most probable diagnosis in relation with this physical finding this looks like flaky paint dermatosis flaky paint dermatosis or dermatitis okay or we also have another name for this this is crazy pavement dermatitis crazy pavement dermatitis okay and this is flag sign this is called flag sign what is flag sign flag sign is alternate band of dark and gray hair uh, on the scalp okay or on the on the hair okay flag sign right so if these two uh, scenario are given to you if they ask you what is the most probable diagnosis without any doubt okay you can say this is a case of quasi worker quasi worker and quasi worker is a type of okay acute severe malnutrition okay it is a type of severe malnutrition now some related question they may ask you and that is name some of the important complication you can always write the important complication okay let me do it in another slide so the important complication important complications in case of quasi worker as well as marasmus okay known by the shimonic shielded okay shielded fine so s means sugar deficiency that is hypoglycemia h for hypothermia this may be a related question that's why i'm, I'm uh, telling you here okay i for infection infection okay this e and l for electrolyte abnormality electrolyte disturbance or abnormality okay d and e for dehydration dehydration okay and this d for some other things okay like micronutrient deficiency micronutrient deficiency okay or sometimes even death so these are some of the very important related question which may be asked to you now let's move on this case is a very very common case in pediatrics look at this picture and look at the clinical scenario it's a 10 year old girl who present with rashes in the lower limbs for the last seven days joint swelling for the last five days and abdominal pain for the last five days so what is the diagnosis based on this rashes and this clinical you know scenario so this is a case of hanok sconleon purpura okay hanok sconleon purpura so this is the diagnosis and in hanok sconleon purpura the typical findings would be okay there are four important features together number one is rashes you can see these rashes here in the picture these rashes are mainly present in the lower limbs lower limbs along with buttocks area okay they are palpable rash palpable because they are called vasculitic rash iga vasculitis is another name for hanox conleon purpura and they are not painful and not itchy okay and this is the most common type of presentation in hanox conleon purpura the second one is arthritis inflammation of the joint number three is abdominal involvement or you know gi tract involvement there will be abdominal pain there will be hematochagia and in very small baby there may be uh, you know intersusception they may present as intersusception and number four is kidney involvement kidney involvement and as a result of that there will be proteinuria and hematuria in the child and sometimes it may even lead to renal failure so these are some other findings you know uh, of hanox conleon purpura now look at the second question here what is the uh, finding in biopsy in case of hanox conleon purpura and your answer is leukocytoclastic vasculitis leukocytoclastic 
cytoplastic vasculitis. Please memorize this term. This is also known as IgA, okay, vasculitis. And dear students, this is the most common type of vasculitis in pediatric age group. So let's move on. Number six, look at this uh, picture here. And according to the picture, you have to give the diagnosis. So first evaluate the picture here, okay? First is splinter hemorrhage. Now splinter hemorrhage are, see the typical shape hemorrhage on the nail bed. Genuine lesion, they are painless macular lesion on the palm and shoal. This is palm and this is shoal. Third is ostler node. Ostler nodes are painful P-sized lesion on the pulp of the finger. Okay. Now see this. They are pink, they are P-sized, they are painful and they are present in the pulp of the finger. So these are ostler node. This is conjunctival hemorrhage. Okay. So if I combine all these things together, whatever diagnosis we think, this is no doubt a case of infective endocarditis. Infective or infectious endocarditis. Okay. And what is the most common causative organism to cause it? And the answer is Streptococcus viridans. Streptococcus viridans group. This Streptococcus viridans group are very commonly, you know, found in the oral cavity. The different species, you know. So the commonly they are called viridans group of streptococci and they are the most common cause of infective endocarditis. A little bit of knowledge here. Infective endocarditis is mainly the bacterial type is mainly of two. One is acute and another is subacute. The subacute variety is more common than the acute and this streptococcus viridans usually cause subacute, you know, subacute type of endocarditis. And acute infective endocarditis is mainly caused by Staphylococcus aureus, okay? Because these are very common and catchy question in your licensing exam as well. Now, number seven, look at this picture. What are the X-ray findings and what is the diagnosis? Look at this X-ray very carefully. This X-ray looks like egg on side appearance. Egg on side appearance, okay? Look at very carefully once again, egg on side appearance, you know. So see this, if I draw, okay, so it looks like this egg on side appearance. So this is the, you know, x-ray appearance. And one more thing on the x-ray actually, you know, there is pulmonary plethora as well. There is a lot of blood flow to the lung. So this is pulmonary plethora. Now, what type of heart disease is it, okay? according to the diagnosis. First, let's make a diagnosis. This is a classical case of TGA, transposition of the great artery. Transposition of great arteries. Okay, TGA. And what type of heart disease is this? It's straightforward. This is a cyanotic congenital heart disease. Cyanotic congenital heart disease, you know. And remember one thing, they may ask you, this is a ductal dependent lesion because without, uh, you know, doctor's arteriosis, you know, this, uh, you know, baby or child may not survive. Okay. So this is also known as ductal dependent congenital heart disease. Now, number eight, let's move further. Now, there's a clinical scenario which is provided to you. There's a two-year-old male baby presented with cyanosis and failure to thrive. On examination, clubbing was present. So this is typically a case of congenital cyanotic heart disease and auscultation revealed ejection systolic murmur at the pulmonic area or pulmonary area and investigation revealed hemoglobin was 20 gram. Now let's evaluate the case first, okay? And then we we'll go to the question. Clear cut, this is a case of cyanotic congenital heart disease because the baby has presented with cyanosis from very early uh, period of life and other clues are also there. There is failure to thrive because in cyanotic heart disease, there is persistent hypoxia. And when hypoxia is there for a long time, the baby is not gaining weight and as well as height, you know, which is called failure to thrive. Clubbing was present. Clubbing is a classical, you know, presentation in case of cyanotic congenital heart disease. And the more important clue here is on pulmonary area, there is ejection systolic murmur. This, all of this, if I combine together, okay, and look at the x-ray here. This x-ray, chest x-ray is provided to you. It looks like boot-shaped heart. Boot-shaped heart. And when all this clue, okay, 
are provided to you it is none other than tetralogy of fallot t o f tetralogy of fallot okay tetralogy of fallot now when we make a diagnosis now write uh, two complications of tetralogy of fallot it is very easy for you uh, this is uh, actually cerebral ischemia okay brain abscess brain abscess another one would be uh, infective endocarditis infective endocarditis and very very rarely very rarely even congestive heart failure but congestive heart failure usually doesn't occur in a typical uh, tetralogy of fallot okay now one question i like to ask you here why this hemoglobin was 20 gram uh, this is called polycythemia and the answer is pretty simple here because of persistent hypoxia uh, you know the erythropoietin hormone will be released erythropoietin hormone will cause excessive synthesis of rbc which leads to polycythemia and this polycythemia is responsible for cerebral ischemia as a result of excessive thrombus formation okay and uh, other uh, complications are already listed there let's move on question number nine here what is the x-ray finding in this case and what is the diagnosis straightforward question look at the x-ray very carefully this x-ray is showing figure of eight appearance See, this is figure of eight appearance figure of eight appearance okay whenever you have figure of eight appearance in the x-ray straightforward the diagnosis will be tapvr or tapvc so what is the full form of this total anomalous pulmonary venous return or connection okay return or connection this is the diagnosis here and uh, you know a little bit uh, more about it this is a type of cyanotic congenital heart disease this is a cyanotic congenital heart disease and here the pulmonary vein drain the blood uh, to the right atrium through some abnormal connection now question number 10 we have and there's a clinical scenario for you a 12 year old girl presented with shortness of breath at exertion and palpitation for a month during auscultation there is a mid diastolic murmur at the apex and x-ray showed straightening of the left heart border so what is the diagnosis there are a lot of clues provided for the diagnosis here okay and this is a case of mitral stenosis mitral stenosis and what are the points in favor of mitral stenosis here see the shortness of breath and exertion and palpitation per month palpitation is usually caused by atrial fibrillation which occurs as a result of late at left atrial dilation here okay and another strongest clue for you is mid diastolic murmur at the apex which is a classical features of mitral stenosis and x-ray showed straightening of left heart border now what are the other auscultatory finding in mitral stenosis now others are loud first heart sound loud s1 second is opening snap and third one okay is accentuation accentuation of the murmur of the murmur before first heart sound before first heart sound it is also known as presystolic accentuation so these are some other auscultatory findings of mitral stenosis apart from mid diastolic murmur now dear students sometimes the examiner will ask another type of question here what are the differential diagnosis of mitral stenosis related to the murmur means what are the other causes of uh, you know diastolic murmur and the answer would be austin flint murmur caricum's murmur okay and gram steel murmur so i'm, I'm going to write uh, those points for you austin flint okay caricum's and gram steel gram steel murmur now where these murmurs would be heard austin flint is a typical feature of aortic regurgitation caricoms is seen in acute rheumatic fever 
and gram steel murmur is seen in pulmonary regurgitation okay so these are some other related questions here now question number 11 look at it here directly the findings are given so here is the dilated fourth ventricle so this is dilated fourth ventricle fourth ventricle which is dilated there is a shear shaft cyst which is connected with the fourth ventricle this is the shear shaft cyst CSF cyst which is in connection with the fourth ventricle and there is hypoplastic cerebellum this is cerebellum you know this is cerebellum so this is hypoplastic here so if this type of clues are provided in the CT scan or MRI to you then the diagnosis is straightforward and that is called dandy walker malformation dandy walker malformation memorize it okay and name two other causes of hydrocephalus you can easily write arnold carey malformation arnold carey or simple carey malformation these days arnold carey malformation usually uh, type 2 okay and type 2 also presents with uh, spina bifida and another one would be meningitis meningitis okay and even subarachnoid hemorrhage as well as as well as uh, you can write you know stenosis of aqueduct of sylvius stenosis of cerebral aqueduct so these are some of the other answer you can easily give here now the last question for today a three-year-old boy was brought to the hospital with a history of fever and vomiting for the past two days on examination neck stiffness was present so this is a clear-cut case of meningitis now CSF examination revealed protein 80 sugar 60 blood sugar was 85 lymphocyte uh, there are WBC 50 and majority of them are lymphocyte so what is the most likely diagnosis now let's evaluate this case from the very beginning first is look at the duration of the illness it is just for two days okay so it is an acute disease number two look at the presentation fever vomiting neck stiffness so probably this is a meningitis so you know, more differential diagnosis would be bacterial or viral meningitis it is very very unlikely to be tubercular meningitis because of the duration of disease now is it bacterial or viral we need to separate you know look at the protein is it 80 usually in pyogenic or bacterial meningitis the protein content is very high is it more than 100 sometimes even higher than that sugar is 60 and blood sugar is 85 usually sugar would be low in bacterial meningitis much lower okay than the normal but here the sugar is normal here and wbc now normal blood sugar is usually two-third of the blood sugar that's shear shape sugar sorry normal shear shape sugar is two-third of the blood sugar and uh, that's why it is normal here and wbc is 50 and majority of our lymphocyte this is a clear cut case of viral meningitis the question which is uh, usually confused among the students is like a viral versus tubercular because the tubercular meningitis also present in the same way though protein content is very high there and, and sugar is low you know but students usually confuse between these two remember the duration of illness as well in tb it is much longer and write two common causes for it okay, okay enterovirus enteroviruses are the most common cause of uh, viral meningitis and another is herpes simplex virus okay and other types of viruses as well so dear students uh, you know after a long time i have uh, made this uh, you know video i hope it would be very helpful for you so thank you